We started a D-Day from Bournemouth University in 2003. Myself, uh, my colleague uh, Alex, colleagues Alex, Gary and Ross, uh, who are dotted around today. Uh, went to Bournemouth University, we did a very uh, technical software course uh, for three years whilst also, also doing a placement. And um, when we graduated, um, we realised that we could do a lot of the things that businesses needed, um, despite the fact we didn't have a huge amount of business experience. So um, we started our, our company with uh, no money, with no connections uh, and no real idea, I guess, to be honest. Um, and we started building websites for local businesses using our digital expertise, because at those, in those days, um, the internet was something that graphic companies did or advertising companies did, and they came from very much a print background and didn't know how to do the technical stuff. So we had that great advantage, uh, and still do to, to a large extent over a lot of our competitors. But when we were building these websites, I started to realise that actually they're only ever good, and people only really get their money back if people find them and use them. So I started looking at um, search engine optimization. I started looking at Google AdWords uh, and various other things and uh, trying to understand how these things worked and how we could then get more visits and ultimately more sales and revenue for our clients. So I spent about a decade doing that and then um, after about a decade or so I found my way to being CEO where I started to think more about how does the company run, how do we service our clients, are the teams right, how do we recruit, what's our culture, what's our vision and looking at all those great things. So uh, my view now is very much forward thinking, forward looking to try and think about what will the world be like in three or five years time? Are these trends that are gonna stay? Are they gonna be used by the, um, the masses? And if not, or if they are, how do we adapt? How do we get the most value for our clients today with that sort of long-term uh, view in our minds? And there's a picture here of uh, the sea. Um, it's a picture of Westbourne Beach. Um, so in the summer months, from about now until October, November, uh, I like to swim in the sea down in Bournemouth. Some people think I'm absolutely crazy, um, and you can have that uh, view if you want to, but um, you know, swimming in the sea is a very joyous thing, especially in the middle of the summer when no one else is on the beach, and it's basically my own personal beach and the sunshine is out, and I get to feel like I'm on holiday, even though I'm not. So, um, probably down the next week, seven o'clock, Westbourne, I'll see you all there. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, marketing in the attention age, and. Um, actually s encourage you to maybe put your phone down a little bit more than perhaps you've done in other talks. Normally a speaker will come on the stage and say, you know, tweet me during the thing. If you like what you're hearing, tweet about it or you know, share it online. You can do that, but I'd rather in this instance you maybe put your phone down a little bit more than you would do usually uh, and just try and uh, uh, think about some of the things I'm saying um, rather than um, trying to do two or three things at once. So you don't have to smash your phone, but maybe just uh, put it down slightly more. So what is attention? We, you know, we are an attention agency, we're a, a summit called Attention. Um, what, is, what is the definition of that? Um, so looking at the, the formalised definition of attention, um, there's three ways of um, understanding it. The first is that we take notice of someone or something and we regard something as re uh, relevant, important or interesting. That's the first definition. The second is that we take action of dealing with or taking care of special care of someone or something where we actually focus our, our attention on that person, on that objective, on that goal. Uh, and the third, I guess, is more sympathetic in terms of consideration of the needs of others at once. Have I given you enough attention today, my darling? You, yes, of course you have, Andrew, your, your wonderful husband. That sort of thing. But I think the simplest way, or the purest way, is basically focusing our attention on one particular idea or task over a multitude of others. And we've already talked or touched upon the fact that there are many, many ways to get distracted in this world that we live in through the various screens that we've got. Um, so how do we actually get the purest attention of people? And looking back over the last sort of 50, 60 years, there have been moments where perhaps globally we've all been paying attention to something. One of the most famous ones is the moon landing back in the 60s, where we were, as a, as a, as a planet, I guess, fixated on this idea of man going to the moon and the fact that we managed to take a group of people, put them in a big metal shell, send them up in a rocket, and get them to walk on this other planet, which is you know, millions and millions of miles away, was fascinating. And it did capture the whole globe's attention. And when uh, Red Bull did the uh, stratosphere dive a few years ago, did you, watch, did you watch that on YouTube? I watched a live stream of that, and that actually captivated me for a good few hours. This guy was going up in this um, you know, m m vessel into the edge of the space. You know, I've never seen anything like it before. I was giving my full attention to this thing for two hours. 
uh, and that's amazing. But you know, those once in a lifetime things are, are rare, um, and uh, attention can be ma many different things. And you know, from a from a simplistic point of view, for me, this is something that I can identify with. It's you know, looking after my garden. It's planting seeds. It's growing vegetables. For those moments during the week where I can actually turn everything off and give my full attention to something which is a bit more um, connect, I can connect with on a more human level. You know, getting my hands dirty and you know and growing things, I think, is um, something we probably should all be doing a bit more in terms of getting back to our roots. So that's something I, that I think is a good definition or a version of attention. Uh, increasingly, uh, we have to think about attention as, as being grabbed. Uh, and the best example I can think of in, in terms of grabbing attention is, uh, is this lady here. I guess we've all seen her in various states of undress over the years. Um, and she grabs attention. I don't think she's really necessarily doing it the right way, but um, it's certainly something that if you want to take a particular a particular route, you can go down that way. But there's not, I don't think there's any long-lasting value in the way that she does, or perhaps other people do similar things, of, of grabbing attention rather than nurturing it uh, or, or being, um, you know, connecting on the depth. So we have an attention problem. First is that, you know, from a, from a branding or a marketing point of view, the world has changed significantly. The way we do things has, has changed significantly. The media world has changed significantly. Um, and the reason for that is because we, we can all be publishers. You know, many, many decades ago, you know, the channels of connecting with people were very limited. It was television, which was a few networks. It was a few uh, newspaper publishers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But now, thanks to the likes of social media and all these platforms, we can all become publishers of our own videos, of our own images, of our own content, of our own thoughts. Um, and that's basically created a world where content and information was at, has gone to, um, from scarcity to obesity. I say it's obesity. Richard, um, who did the talk earlier on, was talking about abundance. But I actually think there's now too much. Um, and we live in a, a data or a content obese world of sorts. And as a result, when there's so much stuff out there, I think no one really pays enough attention, unfortunately. Um, and this is sort of illustrated from a, from a media point of view, television point of view, where it, television used to be limited to two, three channels and then four channels. And now when I turn on my Virgin box and you turn on your Skybox at home, there are probably hundreds of channels that you can choose from. And they're all showing pretty much 24 hours a day. Some of them go on or off. But only 30, 40 years ago, television was a few channels, and not only that, it used to stop. And used to, sometimes I used to come home, um, my early drink, drinking days, and turn on television, it was that white fuzz, the background noise of the Big Bang, I think, that, that fuzz was. Uh, and there's a story I heard on uh, the Danny Baker show a while ago, where he interviewed someone who's talking about the Grey Whistle Test, which was a music programme in the 70s. It was shown on Friday night, and it ran from 9 until half past 10 on a Friday night. But because there was nothing on afterwards, um, and all that happened was BBC shut down. Everyone packed up and went home. If the band carried on playing till quarter to 11 or 11 o'clock, they just carried on broadcasting it. And there was no definite, definite cut-off. There was no end. They just, right, if you want to carry on playing, guys, just go for it. We'll just pack up when you're finished. And that was the, the scarcity of content. And people would watch that program in their millions. But now, you know, Top of the Pops got axed because no one really watched it anymore. It's all on YouTube and all other different channels. So the amount of information that's out there is, is, is quite um, mad. The amount of information that gets pushed around all these connections that we have these days um, is ever growing. And it's now being measured in a thing called zettabytes, which I'd only recently come across. So we don't think about gigabytes of information or exabytes, which is the level up. We're now talking in zettabytes, because it's a smaller number. Um, and the information I read about this that said if you'd recorded every single word spoken by humanity ever, it would equate to about the information that will be pushed around the internet in about 2019, 2020. So in one year's worth of doing stuff and, uh, online and using digital, we could have recorded every single word spoken by every person of all time, which I think is quite mad in terms of the, the stuff that's getting produced. And that's produced on Facebook, there's about 100 megs of data, um, and we're just seeing this grow and grow and grow and grow. So if you want to see what a zettabyte looks like, one of your pieces you can take away today, that is one zettabyte of information. It's a lot of zeros, I can't even start to comprehend that. And the rise of smartphones and 3G and 4G and the Wi-Fi is the reason why we can do all of this stuff. You know, when we started 
uh, 15 years ago, dialogue was still quite prevalent. And you know, to sit there and write stuff and watch a video was really quite a painful thing. Um, and again, I think the sort of generation of today don't really appreciate what it was like in those days. Um, and I think there was a, a study done recently where they basically gave a bunch of teenagers uh, a broadband, a dial-up connection, and the pain on their face, this is broken, this just doesn't work. What's going on? No, it's just you've got to wait for those lines of the picture to, to scroll and make. So smartphones have just taken over and changed our world. We've now become, I think, addicted. I always say addicted. It's a strong word. I appreciate that. But I think we are addicted to our phones. We, we can't go an hour without checking them. Um, you know, if this was a book or something, and I kept picking it up every hour and looking at it, you'd say, Andy, you're addicted to your book. Why do you keep looking at a book for? But because it's our phones, it's part of society, we sort of accept it. And does anyone want to guess the number of times on average in a study that was done a few years ago um, said, on average, we look at our phones per day? Anyone want to guess a few numbers? 45? 200. 200. 200. 200. 200. 200. 200. 200. 200. 200. 200. 200. So on average, in the study they did, people picked up their phones about 150 times a day. I read that and I thought that just seems a pretty extreme number um, in my head. I downloaded an app called Checky, there are many others, put up my phone and it told me, it tells me every day at 12 o'clock how many times I've checked my phone the previous day. My average is about 30 to 40, but that's the number of times I've unlocked my phone, not necessarily the amount of times I've taken out of my pocket and looked at the messages. So it could well be in the high, uh, high dozens, maybe even in the hundreds. So if you don't think you've got a problem, then I would suggest that you maybe take your test yourself and see. And I did this talk a month ago, and people tweeted me the day after and said, oh my God, I've checked my phone 40 times and it's only 10 o'clock in the morning, what on earth am I doing? Um, so you just challenge yourself there. So if we're all checking our phones all the time, there's all this information, what has it done to our attention spans? Microsoft did a study in about 2001, I think, which looked at the average attention span. And in 2001, it was 15 seconds. I guess you know, something we talked about this in the break. If I'd said in 2001, our attention spans are on average 15 seconds, you're going, Jesus, that's a small number. And it is a small number. Back then, you know, it's, it's fairly small. 15 years on, they did the same study. And they found that the average attention span nowadays is about seven seconds. So within 15 years, our attention spans have halved. And again, Richard touched upon the fact that our brains are malleable, and if we reprogram enough times, we start to create different behaviours. Um, and what's happened in those 15 years? Well, it's thanks to these things. We do check them all the time. It's changed our attention span. We flick between moments. You know, I heard a story about angry birds was developed because the guy studied things like cues. He saw where there's gaps in these people's lives where they didn't do anything. They just didn't wondered about what's the world going to be like today, is it going to rain, what we have for dinner. He created a game that was very short and very quick to play that would fill those micro moments and he's made a multi-million pound business from it. So why the picture of the goldfish? Well, you know, the goldfish has often been derided as a little pet that, you know, poor little goldfish, it doesn't know what he's doing, he forgets everything every eight seconds. The, the attention span of the fish is supposed to be eight seconds and we are now registering seven. So we are now spending less time paying attention to something than a goldfish. Quite a scary thought. And I think the reason why our attention spans have been fragmented, I mentioned before, we've got our phones, but you know, the amount of media that's out there has, is, is growing and growing, and what we do is growing and growing. And um, now, more research done last year suggested that the average American, you can apply this to the British, French, whatever, so that we consume about 31 hours of media. We do 31 hours of stuff every 24, hour, uh, 24 hours that we're alive. So we, we consume and we do more things of activity than is actually available during the day. That must mean at some point we're doing two or three or even four things simultaneously. So it's, it's often referred to as multitasking, but um, I think the actual definition is more of uh, multi-task uh, switching. I focus my attention on one thing and I take it off that and put it onto that one, and stuff happens in the background. But you'll see here that video plays a large part of that, both in television, both in terms of uh, YouTube, Instagram, whatever. Uh, audio, we have audio in the background, we consume that without even realising it. Uh, and somewhere in there is work, but um, it's not a high figure. <laughs> so I'm talking about this stuff, you know, we've heard from Richard, there are other speakers, the same sort of theme, you know, the, the CEO of Microsoft have realised this is, a, is an issue. Uh, they said that we're moving from a world of computing power is very scarce to a place where it's basically limitless. 
And because we don't have to think about the, the, the delivery mechanism anymore, actually the real um, scarce commodity we have is human attention. And over, you know, we've, when we think about marketing and advertising and messaging, the world has changed, but not necessarily marketing and advertising. And I think, you know, 20, 30 years ago, broadcasting stuff, putting stuff in magazines and print was the way to do things. You just had to bombard people, and after a while, they got it. But now we can be very subtle with the way we do things and be very personal. Um, and we basically need to respect the consumer because when we show them something, whether it's online or elsewhere, we are interrupting their lives. And people don't really want to see my advert. It just happens to be there because I'm doing an exchange of my eyeballs in return for something, and there's a value exchange there which we price through various mechanisms. So if we are going to actually interrupt people, uh, it says here, you know, if you're going to crash the party, bring some champagne with you. If you're going to interrupt someone online, which is where most people spend their time nowadays, deliver something of, of value and something of worth. And I get massively frustrated where businesses, brands, even small little blogs don't do this. They think about what do I want the person to do rather than what's in it for them. Case in point where this was a website I went on recently and I started to read through the first paragraph and within two, two to three seconds, the subscribe to my newsletter, quick exclusive tips, do it now, came up on the screen. I didn't even finish the paragraph, I don't even know what I'm looking at, and already I'm being asked to sign up for something for someone I don't know, I don't probably care about, I'm not even sure if I want to follow them or, or hear from them ever again. But this is the sort of thing that interrupts me, and I go on my mobile. Uh, this wasn't my um, search, this was from a screen grab, I don't go on the Hollywood Reporter in case you were interested. But a little pop-up came up and I couldn't do the thing, well, in this instance, I couldn't do what they think they wanted because there's an annoying advert in the way. Uh, Gary Vaynerchuk is a, a, name, a guy who I start to name check more and more, he's very shouty, He's very sweary, he's very American. So if you're put off by him like I was initially, um, listen to him, he'll actually say some good, good stuff. And he, he highlighted this problem um, through Samsung. You can type it into YouTube, there's a video of him talking about it. But Samsung kept pushing an advert like this to him when he was trying to check the New York Mets um, transfer rumors and stuff. And he said, after a while, I got so annoyed, I vowed to my wife, I came home and said, I'm never buying an effing Samsung product ever again. Because he got so frustrated with this this brand was basically disrespecting him. I'm never going to spend, uh, buy a Samsung product ever again. And now I'm telling this story because it annoyed someone so much that they took that um, quite strong action. But it's not also pop-ups, it's also content. You know, you go on these clickbaity blogs and at the bottom of them is the 10 best things to change your life. If you click here, this guy will show you how he's lost 17 stone in six seconds, etc., etc. And it devalues content. This guy, John uh, Battelle, he's a very, very uh, well-regarded, I guess, media critic of sorts in America. He says, you know, it devalues your content when you've got this spammy stuff hanging on the bottom of your pages. It doesn't look good to anyone. It doesn't add an, any value to you as a brand. So we've got to really start respecting um, people's time and attention in their journey. Because when they go on social media and things like that, you know, they're not there to look at adverts. They're not there to click on stuff. You look at the click-through rates on Facebook, on average, you know, uh, 0.92 is the highest click-through rate on these adverts. So that's less than one in a hundred people really care about the advert that you're showing them, uh, or certainly bother to click on it. And it can go down to something like 0.03% for dating, which is like three in 10,000 or something. So people don't really care about your adverts, um, and they're not there to click on them. The same goes for video. You know, if your videos are, are, are not really well designed, not really not very well thought through, People are basically not going to remember them. And we've got Heather talking about memory and marketing later on, which would be a really good talk to expand on that. So when there's so much stuff going on in our world, not only online, but also the world around us, um, you know, look at somewhere like Times Square, there's just it's sort of iconic. It was the pinnacle of the 80s of advertising and marketing where you had to have your billboard there, otherwise you were nothing. And the MD or the CEO said, right, guys, we've got to be there because everyone else is. You don't really pay attention to anything. You know, you, there's a, a word for this um, development, I guess, it's called inattentional deficit, where we don't notice something because there is basically too much other stuff going on. Uh, we can also work the other way, where you don't notice something because you're really fully concentrating on it and giving it your full attention. The awareness test, <laughs> I'll send the link afterwards, was there to basically see if you paid attention to the video. Uh, the video had two teams, uh, as you didn't see, but I saw, uh, of four people in white playing basketball, four people in black playing basketball. And the idea, as you may have heard, was to try and count how many times the team in white passed the ball to each other. 
and the team in white passed the ball 13 times. The black team were passing around the white team, but one of the black guy, uh, guys who went black was, um, went off the screen and in his place walked across the screen and in full daylight, you can see him, dressed as a bear doing a moonwalk. And because you're concentrating so much on the white team, you don't actually pay any attention to what the black team are doing and you can miss this very obvious thing of a, a man dressed as a bear doing a moonwalk. Uh, and normally when I show that to people, and they see it, um, about 90% of people don't see the moonwalking bear and you watch it again and actually you do. And it's actually a video for um, uh, dry, uh, bicycle awareness in London. But it gets the point across, if you really do concentrate on something, you will fully see it. But in the background, if there is a noise or a thing that you're not trying to pay attention to, you'll miss it. So how do we adapt to this changing world? How do we do things differently? Um, we as an attention agency have come up with the attention model, which is based on three different things. Um, first, it's about exploring a brand, a business, a small business, uh, an MD even sometimes, to understand what it is that they're trying to do as a business. Why are they different? What do they stand for? What are their beliefs? What are their values? What are their missions they're trying to achieve? And for us to really get under the skin of what they're trying to do and then think about how do we communicate this out in the best way. We then create some uh, content, create some uh, assets, be it a website, be it some search marketing, and then try and captivate people over a period of time, whether it's maybe seconds, maybe it's minutes, days or weeks, and ultimately years to create some real lifetime value and go through this process of really understanding creating and ultimately captivating people as best we can so they do pay attention, so they do understand what we're trying to say and they do see a point of differentiation. So Gareth uh, mentioned earlier on about um, the fact that they've started to think about why is Southampton here and what does it stand for? And I think that slide or that process was um, very much borrowed from the work of Simon Sinek. So if you've not heard of him, um, Google him, YouTube him, he's done an amazing TED talk about the golden circle. His study of why great leaders are great leaders and how do they communicate and how do great brands and businesses communicate. And it's really about thinking about why they are there, what they believe and what do they stand for. And, and some of the guys upstairs are talking about tribal marketing, which is a long, you know, aligned to this thought of, I'm here, I stand for this, who's going to join me and, and come with me on this journey? Rather than thinking about the what it is that you do, everyone knows what they do and sometimes they know how they do it, but why do they do what they do? For us it's about delivering attention to really the brands that deserve it. That's fairly subjective. We, work, we have got some clients we've turned away, some we work with now who we're, who we're um, ending relationships with because they don't really value us, they don't, we don't think necessarily um, worthy of our attention or perhaps in the, the wider world. And that model of the, of the why resonates very much with how our brains work and how we're actually hardwired as human beings. So you have a thing called the limbic brain, which basically deals with this uh, unconscious stuff, all these emotional things we don't really truly understand. And the neocortex is our basic our verbalization of all the things that go on in our brain. Um, you know, and the more I read and the more I hear about this, actually scientists have really got no bloody idea, even in 2016, about how our brains work. Uh, and they're still trying to get even just some sort of notion of um, our rationalization for doing things. Because we know that people buy on emotion and they justify with logic. That's why you go to networking events, because you meet people and you decide, yeah, I, li I like these guys and I think I can work with them. And you just sort of justify it with, with the rational stuff. So if you're trying to communicate a different type of sales process to people or communicate with people online, if you're trying to do a simple sale, then sometimes the rational communication work, buy this product, it's X percent faster, it's 20% cheaper, it's going to last 7% longer, etc., etc. That can work quite well. If it's more of an intuit, uh, complex sale, then going more on intuition um, tends to work better. So again, something like you know, buying um, digital services, you know, I can rationalise it with everyone else, but if, uh, if it's more of a B2B type sale, more of a people sale, then we need to think about building that into our communications, which is why a lot of professional services companies talk about their people, because we're trying to buy from people and tell um, the world how great they are. You know, good companies are doing this. I can use some you know, famous examples like Apple, where their strap liners think different. So in a world where Microsoft and Dell are all talking about features, 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 Apple said, you know, we don't, we don't think like that. We don't think about you know, numbers. We don't think about technology in the same way you do. We're different. We think about things differently. And people recognized, identified with this, 
and they started queuing up for three days to buy a bloody phone when it first came out. You know, there's so much depth in the belief that uh, people have of Apple that it's transferred into the biggest company in the world. Harley Davidson stands for you know way of life. There, there is a uh, probably a, a why with a Harley Davidson. I don't really relate to it, but a lot of people do. And they're happy to get their the corporate brand logo of that company who makes bicycles effectively tattooed on their arm because it stands for something, it means something, and there's some depth and emotional connection. Um, those are big companies. There are also sm some small companies. There's a, a company called Lunched, who we use. If you're based in Bournemouth or Dorset, they do some amazing lunches and they will deliver it to your office. I think one of the reasons why Ollie started the company was to, um, you know, try and fight against this typical expectation of what a lunch is. You know, is it really sandwiches and crisps? Is this as far as we've come? Isn't there a better way? Um, and he tells his story about how he finds his products, how he makes his products on his uh, website, creates videos about him visiting. This is a National Trust place, Kingston Lacey, where he um, goes to visit some of the places where his food is grown and tells that story. So there's an emotional reason for why you buy his products, apart from it tastes bloody amazing. Um, and I, again, I read all these things and I was, I, I'm seen as quite analytical. I, I am, can, can be very analytical, but I also fall foul of this emotional thing. Um, I bought a new car at the weekend. I've got a, a third child on the way very shortly. I need a bigger car. I set myself a budget with my wife and went through a spreadsheet and we went through all the numbers. We need to pay some money here, money for this. And I needed to test drive one of the cars I identified of buying. So I, the only one I could find was 1,500 quid more than my budget, but I needed to test drive it. So we went down to uh, Bournemouth at the weekend uh, and sat in the car and said, actually, yeah, this is, this is the car we want to buy. So we want to buy this car. We love it. It was £1,500 more than I budgeted for. It's a lot of money. But when we got home, we sort of thought, well, actually, it's a bit lower mileage and, you know, it's a bit newer than we thought we were going to buy. So we can afford that, that you know, that 1500 quid. Rationalised it, even though emotionally we made the purchase um, with our hearts. So there is an emotional side to us. We need to bear that in mind. How do we tap into that if we're doing content and, and selling ourselves and pushing messages online? Well, if we're trying to push content out and tell our story, and emotionally connect with people, then we need to do uh, one of three things. This is from, uh, it's not Paul Hollywood, it's a guy called uh, Tom Webster. He said, if you're producing content, then it should ideally entertain or challenge or come from genuine expertise. Or ultimately, all three. If we can do that, then we're really hitting the nail on the head. A good example of where I think people have used uh, uh, the networks and the content uh, platforms available to sell stuff, I'll talk about in a second, but Traditionally, we may have come to sell something like a blender by talking about the features. So this is a, the, on the Philips website. I'm not saying this is a bad product or a good product, but uh, these are the features they sell on. So they're selling on features, which is a two litre glass jar, which I understand. Um, I can fit enough smoothie in there or soup to make what I want. It comes as a patch, that's useful. 800 watts, does that mean it's powerful? What's the standard? I don't know idea, and I don't know what ProBlend 6 is. Any ideas, anyone? No. That's one way of talking about product or selling the product. Um, and a better way is to basically show or tell a story. And I've used Will It Blend for probably about 10 years or so in my slides, and I still keep referring back to it because it's one of the best things I've seen in terms of selling perhaps a very banal or ordinary product and telling the story and using a, a marketing in a very interesting way. Has anyone not heard of Will It Blend? few people. Half the group in the previous talk hadn't heard of it. So Willet Blend was a, 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 com a company, Blendtec, make these amazing or very powerful uh, blenders used in um, lots of commercial uh, food production. They said our blenders are much better than everyone else's, we need to tell everyone this. And the CEO had basically picked up on YouTube, perhaps because one of his kids was playing around with it, and said, well, I can tell my story better than anyone else. I'll put my blender in, start st showing everyone how bloody amazing our blenders are. So he started getting golf balls and light bulbs and uh, cricket bats and things and putting them in the blender and they were actually going down to, to nothing. They're like, absolutely incredible. And over a period of months he was putting new different products in there and people picked up on this. Um, and the views that these videos were getting were in the tens or hundreds of thousands globally. When the new one of the new iPhones came out, I think that Apple paid money for him to put their new product in their blender and blend it down to a pile of metal and glass. Um, the power of that brand, and the, you know, the, the, the community, I guess, that they had at that time was phenomenal. And now when I go around the south of England, 
to various smoothie shops or whatever or, or, um, restaurants, I look and I see the blender and quite a lot of the time it's a blends tech blender. This little company from America now is making smoothies globally, largely down to some of the things like this. So think about if you do have a product to sell, you don't just have to sell on the features and tell a, a, a and perhaps a, a dull story. You can think about doing things more creatively. We can own that connection with the user. We don't have to rely on broadcasting it out um, through various or traditional networks. And I think in Disney have done a very interesting thing recently where instead of using cinemas perhaps to uh, create a relationship with their consumers <coughs> or uh, things like Netflix, they've actually created their own channel. I'm not going to use any of those things. If you're really into Disney, you can connect with us directly. We can give you exclusive content and in this case pay £10 or something per month. So they've gone away from the traditional model and have the direct um, relationship and hopefully monetizing like that, which is quite interesting. Um, when it comes to telling a story, you know, we um, had a challenge with a client um, where they needed to tell the story of this uh, oil and gas production plant in South Wales called South Hook. Um, quite a, a, a bland or perhaps an uninteresting topic to a lot of people. They need to tell a story about how their process works, the security that's involved, the complexity of some of the things they do. Um, not only to you know, the stakeholders, but some of the stakeholders with schools, the local community, people that, you know, that thing over there that's massive and has got a shitload of oil and gas in it that could explode at any minute, and I only live a few hundred yards away, what, how do I know this is safe? Should I be living here or moving? So we created this infographic that basically took all this information and told this story over a period of a, a minute or two with, as an interactive web page that people could sit and understand and hopefully pay attention to to understand exactly what the, the issues were. So it doesn't have to be uh, boring or banal, you can take content and do it in different ways. Um, the way we produce content and the, and the depth of attention people give it um, can vary, and we, we've already heard about that. This is an interesting slide from a guy called uh, Farish Jacob, if you want to know more about the attention ideas we talked about today, you can follow him online. His company is called Genius Steals, so I stole his slide, because I'm a genius. Um, and it's talking here about different types of uh, interaction that people will have, the length of time that they spend on things, and the depth or the quality of attention that they will give it. So typically a TV ad will be 30 seconds, very short, I don't really pay a lot of attention to it. World of Warcraft might take me three, four, five days, um, but I'm fully engrossed, it's the only thing I give my attention to. Some of the guys in the office um, say, what are you up to at the weekend? I'm just gaming from like 12 to 3 in the morning, like 15 hours in a row. They don't think of anything else, just full attention on that thing, which is amazing. Um, you know, there are various other things missing from this. I think, you know, football and music tend to be, to be the ultimate in terms of attention. Well, I think, again, that's got fragmented thanks to smartphones. When you go to the gig, you now take the selfie, you video it, you know, you, you're not really there, you're not paying as much attention as you perhaps once were. But still, you're fully engrossed. You believe in the band, you believe in the football club, you believe in the sporting event you're in. You give everything you can to it. You get emotionally involved. I think the high, that's probably one of the highest quality things you can have. Things like Candy Crush. You know, I watch people on the train, and they spend two to five minutes fully engaged in this game, fully doing flicking around, and then they get off their stop on the tube or whatever it is. So they're really involved in that, but only for a short period of time. And in those micro moments, you've seen the rise of like Angry Birds and Candy Crush come up because. That two, three minute bus journey, walk, queue in the post office you used to have where you just pondered, you now fill it with a, mic, you know, a game or something else because we're, we're addicted to our phones, I guess. Uh, and content can also be digested very, very quickly, but I think if it is very good and very relevant and very specific to me, then I will give it my full attention. So um, to quote um, Richard, who was on this morning, you know, we really do need to try and adapt the way we think about things and, and communicate. And there's two main ways. One is to try and find those moments where people are fully giving attention to something, whether it's in the cinema or, or somewhere else. You can target people at the right time in the right place now. But if, if they are fleetingly paying attention to something, whether it's your Facebook ad, whether it's your Google ad, whether it's your, your email even that you've sent them, we need to really think about our copy and our content and brutally simplify it down to as short a context as we can. And there are ways and means of targeting people at the right place at the right time with the right demographic. You know, I go to the gym and when I'm on the, uh, at the gym I'm often on the treadmill or on the bike and there are screens around. And at that moment I'm really thinking about pushing myself, really like try and you know, burn as many calories or do as many reps as I can or something. 
Um, and I'm fully engrossed, and those screens are really op serve a great opportunity to, to get my message across to the right people. In terms of content and copy, if you want to really think about how to um, simplify something and, and you want to know how to do it really well, um, there's a guy called Dave Trott who's a very famous uh, advertising hack, I guess. Uh, he's been doing it for 20, 30 years. His blog, every blog post is probably 60 to 90 second read. No sentence is really longer than 10 words. But he gets really good content across, really good ideas, challenges your thoughts, all those three things I talked about in a very simple but brutally uh, clear and concise manner. So if you really want to think about how to do good copy, I'd recommend you read his book or follow him. Um, so you think about how does that affect us? How do we do things differently? First of all, we need to stop grabbing attention. I don't think it really works. It can even be to the detriment of your brand. So think about what you stand for. What is it that you're trying to achieve as a business? How do you create that emotional connection with people uh, when it comes to your messaging communications? And try and think about connecting people at, at the right place at the right time. Um, and also change perhaps how you measure your success. Because whilst numbers are great, it's not necessarily the be all and end all. So this guy, Gary Venture, I talked about before, he only wrote this a couple of days ago saying that we should really be thinking about value. You know, numbers don't necessarily equate to value. How do we change our mindset, stop focusing on numbers of views or impressions and thinking about people that care about our brand? You know, I think that may be one of the new measures we start to see in the next three to five years. Because at the end of the day, it's people that really care about your brand where you get the most value rather than just the 10,000 followers on Facebook who never interact with you. So challenge how you think about um, success uh, and hopefully you can improve things. Thank you very much for listening and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.